is November the 9th, 1995. It was on this date, November the 9th and 10th, 1938, that that horrific period called the Holocaust began in Nazi Germany and Austria, when thousands upon thousands of Jewish men were arrested, taken to camps, when synagogues were burned and Jewish store windows were broken. And it was the beginning of the end for, for European Jewry. And today we are at Wright State University to hear the, the story of one survivor of the Holocaust who now lives in Dayton, Ohio, Sam Hyder. Sam, I know that this period for you was like a nightmare, but that you're willing to tell your story for history. And so tell us where you were born and how your life started. I was born in a small village in Poland to the parents of Jewish farmers. This in itself was a rarity in Poland because very few Jews owned farms in Poland. But we were fortunate enough to have the farm which was passed on from generation to generation. And my, my father was very proud to be a farmer, even though he was a very religious man, but he loved his farm. I was a third child born among six children. Before me was my sister, my older brother. After me, I had another sister, a younger brother, and my youngest sister was only seven years old. When um, your life was pretty normal, or was there, were there evidences of, of problems, even as a child that you remember? In a way, it was normal, but as I remember being a child, I was subjected to anti-Semitism almost on a daily basis. Even when I went to school, I was the only Jewish boy in school, and all my classmates, whenever they had the opportunity, they beat me up. Even my principal, very seldom that he called me by my name. It was always Jew. Or when he was nice enough, he would call me Jew boy. If nobody would know the answer in, in, the, in the class, in the school, then he would turn to me and would say, the Jew must know the answer. So I was subjected to anti-Semitism at, even at my childhood. But we lived on the farm. We progressed on the farm. We had a nice farm. We had a nice orchard with 16 acres of fruit. Even before the war, as I remember, 1935, we planted 300 trees. And in Jewish tradition, we couldn't eat the fruit before three years. So in 1938, when the fruit was ripe for us, then we started to pick the fruit. Our farm was well known all over Poland because we had the best fruits that was available. And we lived on the farm till 19, actually till 1941. When was the first evidences that something different was happening in your village or around your farm? Even though we had a small village, there was only five Jewish families lived on that, in that particular village. But we knew already what happened in Germany. We you were, did now, you had heard. We were aware because some Jews, they would come to us and seek shelter. And we would take them in for a few days, perhaps for a week, I don't remember. But I remember some Jews from Germany came to us. And they would tell us the story how it happened in 1938, the Kristallnacht. And this is how it all began. So we were aware, aware of the, what was going on in Germany. But we couldn't, couldn't visualize it. And our parents used to tell us, the Germans are not so bad. Because my father was in the war. And he fought against the Germans. And we didn't think that something, something terrible is coming. Did you begin, at, at some point, you saw German soldiers or Gestapo, or were they Polish soldiers? What did you see, that first evidence that there the was? The first evidence we saw after September, I think it was already September 2nd or 3rd, and the Germans were, were already in Poland. In 30? In 1939, September 1st, 1939, when the war broke out. Right. But when they came to our village, we didn't think nothing of it. They used to tell us, how come you speak a little bit German? Uh, we were aware, aware of it that we 
we are Jews and we told them we were learned in school. So we, we knew already in 1939 that something is wrong. You didn't see mass uh, deportations because there were so few Jews right around you. No, we didn't, we didn't, know, we didn't even know about it. Right. Because being in a small village, very seldom we had the news. There was no television. There was mm -hmm. no news. We didn't even have electricity. So when, when did the first blow come to you personally? Actually, it was in 1940. We lived on the farm, and some assess came to, to the village, and the constable from the village came to us, and he told us that there are some Germans here, and they want to know how come that you live here on the farm. And he explained to them, to the Germans, that we are here from generations, and we, that we work on the farm. And he, the Germans told him after they left that it's all right for them to stay here and work on the farm. And we were uh, happy, so to speak, that we are allowed to stay on the farm. Sure. But when they left, and we did stay on the farm till 1941, it was amazing that they allowed us to stay in, uh, till 1941. Did they take any of your food uh, that you produced or Absolutely anything? not. As no. a matter of fact, uh, all the pro produce what they Bought, they paid for, for it. But as early as 1940, I remember it was a very heavy winter. It was so much snow. And the constable came to me, to my father, and he said, I have to take Shmuel to shovel snow. Which was your Hebrew name. My, my Hebrew name. I gave him Jewish name or Hebrew name. Right. And he said, I have to take him to shovel snow. So I asked my father, why does he take me? Why doesn't he take my, my uh, friends here? Why do I have to go? And my father said, you don't ask no questions. The problem was we did ask questions, mm -hmm. but we were given the wrong answers. So even in 1940, we could already experience that something is going on, something happened. My, my youngest sister, she was seven years old, when the war broke out, she even asked, Mother, how come all my friends are going to school? Why can't I go to school? So she wasn't allowed anymore. She wasn't allowed because being Jewish, but how can you explain to a seven-year-old kid that she is not allowed to go to school because she is Jewish? Right. So what happened then, then slowly things got worse for your family? But in 1941, the same constable from the village came to us he said, I'm sorry to tell you, I don't know how to tell you, but you have to leave the farm. Even so, Jews being already ex exterminated, and Jews were already killed in, t in cities. And in 1941, we had an a order to leave the farm. So, but he said, you're allowed to take everything w with you. And all the five Jewish families, brothers and sisters who lived on that farm, we had to leave the farm and go to a little town, Bjalobregi, mm -hmm. which was only about seven kilometers from us. We took everything with us. They allowed us to take whatever we had. It was right after the harvest mm -hmm. in 1941, I think around October. As a matter of fact, we took everything with us, potatoes and corn, what we called the rye, and uh, whatever we could except the livestock. We had to leave all the livestock. Right. So in 1941, we left our farm. I still remember my father was the last one. That's all right, Sam. Your father was the last one to leave. And you, you, you all were still together when you got to Yes, we were all still town. together. And then? And he said that after so many years, We have to leave. So we left the farm and we went to that little town of Yalobzegi. And from the beginning, we had plenty, plenty to eat. As a matter of fact, we gave people so much to eat because they were, they were experiencing already hunger, but not us. So people came. My mother was, she was a righteous uh, woman. 
a righteous, righteous woman, righteous woman, religious woman, a religious woman, right? And she gave people, whoever came, who a handout. She gave she them gave them potatoes. She gave them whatever she could. But this was in 1941. But unfortunately, this didn't last long. Maybe six months. After everything was gone, we started experiencing hunger too, because it was already in the beginning of 1942. Were you in a house, or you were in a? Well, first we were in a house because we were. We could afford to live in a house. We rented a house by a Christian family, and we lived in the house there until they put us into a ghetto. Even so, it wasn't a closed-in ghetto, but it was a ghetto. And Jews were not allowed to leave the ghetto. So in 1941, when we experienced hunger already, several times I would go out from the ghetto, whether with my brother or my sister, and we would bring in some food to eat because the Christians, the, the ones who knew us, they would give us plenty to take to take home. I see. And the main thing was that we were all together. Even so, we started experiencing hunger, but we were all together. What happened then, Sam? In uh, 1942, it got so bad, and my mother picked up the the bread. So. It was hard to she share. She sliced it so careful not to give a child a bit. One child more than the other. And then? Until one day, I witnessed my brother, he, he loved bread. My younger brother, he loved bread. Even before the war, as long as he had enough bread, he didn't care for nothing else. But one day, when my mother was passing around the bread, many, many times she didn't leave nothing for herself. But as she was passing around the bread, that's all right. Then what happened? So my brother, my brother went over to my little sister. He gave her the bread. Do you want to get that? You want to get past that part, and it was very difficult. It's hard for people to imagine when there's not even enough bread to go around the family. Yeah, so he asked for a piece of bread, and she said no. Yeah. And then? That's all right. And what did he say? She said, she said, I'm hungry myself. I'm not going to give it to you. So my mother started crying. She lay down on the bed. And I, and I said to myself, I'm not going to take this. Take this anymore. I cannot take this anymore. So that night, well, I, I, I said to myself, I'm going to escape from the ghetto. So I went over to my mother, and I said, Mom, you told her you you had you wanted to leave. I told her I can, I cannot look this anymore, and I'm going to escape from the ghetto. She said, I can. 
I kind of expected this because I, I looked at you this morning, what happened? So she said, I knew what you had in mind. And I knew a Christian family, which I had faith in them, and I knew that if I escaped to them, they're going to keep me there. So you did that. So that night I went over to my mother and I said, Mom, I'm going out from the kid. She hugged me, she kissed me. She, as the first year, she didn't allow me, she rejected it, but said, God, they got me with you. And then I went over to my father and he, he said the same thing. He said, may God, may God protect you from all evil. And I went over to this Christian family, which was only a, kil a kilometer and a half from us, a place called Falinchitze. And I came there, must have been around four o'clock in the morning. I knocked in the window, and I said, I'm, I'm Shmulek. They opened the door for me, and they let me in. And around six o'clock in the morning, they were serving breakfast. So I sat down and had breakfast with them. In the meantime, two, what we called Volksdeutschen, mm -hmm. they came in and they looked at each other and they looked at me. They knew you didn't belong there. They didn't belong there. And all of a sudden, because they had a store and Germans came in day in and day and night, every day they came into the store. When they looked at me, they kind of looked at each other. But this lady, Mrs. Andomia, she kind of looked at me and she said, so tell me, Yannick, how is my sister doing? Like you were a relation of yeah, hers. Yeah, Yannick. So from then on, my name was Yannick. A Christian name. A Christian name. So I said, oh, she's planning to come here this summer. So they thought, you know, that I am a relative, so they might, I'm their nephew. Right. But I was, at least, I was always in constant danger there. And they were hiding me for about six or seven months. I was in hiding. But one time I experienced very bad. One day, a Volksdeutsch came in. We called them, they wore black uniforms, so we called them the, the Schwarze. The black. The black, because they, they were the Gestapo, but they knew, they spoke Polish. So one night, and we were, I was sleeping with my friend, we were sleeping in, in the attic, you know, with hay and straw. And one day, one of the Gestapo men came in. I slept with them every day. They didn't know that I was Jewish. So one night he came in, he said, oh, I'll tell you what happened to today. I saw a Jewish woman. She was carrying her child. And as as, as close as uh, I approached her, she started begging me. I told her, oh, you, you're Jewish. He spoke to her in Polish. He said, oh, you're Jewish. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to kill you. And she started begging him. She said, please, kill me, but don't kill my child. And he and everybody approved because there was maybe 10 or 12 other SS with him or the Gestapo. And everybody started laughing. And I was laying, my friend of mine, Zizek, and I started to cry. And he pinched me. And he said to me, Shmulek. He didn't say Shmulek, he said Yannick. You know, mm -hmm. you know what you're doing? When they left, you have to left. Mm -hmm. So I was laughing from the outside, but my heart was leaning in the inside because I knew who, who it was. And I, and I was with them for maybe six months. But How old were you then, Sam? Do you remember? It was already 1942. I was uh, 18 years old. I was born 1924. But I had another few more experiences, one which is worth mentioning, actually two of them. One day when we were in the fields and in, in, uh, digging potatoes, I think, or something, I don't remember what, and it was very ha hot. And uh, the daughter of my boss, by mistake, she called out the name Schmulek. She said, Schmulek, go bring some water in Polish. 
And the Gestapo was with us constantly every day. And one of them, he grabbed his uh, rifle. He said, oh, you're Jewish, and I'm going to, you know what I'm going to do to you. I'm going to kill you. So the lady from the house, Mrs. Sandomir, she stepped in front of me. She said, you have to kill me before you kill him. That was brave. Yeah, it was, I will never forget this. And she stepped right in front of me. So from then on, I was in constant fear because he knew that I was Jewish. Even so, he didn't tell the other ones, but he knew that I was Jewish. Right. And another incident I had, maybe a, a few weeks later, we were in a, also in a town called, called, called the Gruyets. He had, he had land in this, around this town, and we went to to dig, uh, I remember corn or something, I, I don't remember what. And one of the, of the poles, as, as we were walking, and one of the poles must have told the Germans that I, that I am Jewish. And one of the SS stopped me, and he asked me, where is your Shandband? Your, like your star. My of, star. The yellow star that the people star. had to wear. So I, I said, Tatusha, I, I told this, my, my boss, I spoke, I spoke in Polish to him. I said, Tatusha, what does he want from me? So he said, don't act like you don't understand. You Jewish, you understand. You know what I mean. You are Jewish. You know what I'm going to do to you. So finally, the, my boss, he broke down. He said, oh, he's a poor Jew. Let him go. He works. He always worked on a farm. They own the farm. Please let him go. He said, no, you give the, all the equipment what I carried with me. He said, you give it to your boss, and I'm going to take you out of town, and I'm going to kill you. And this, and he knew that, you know, I would be killed. And as soon as, as soon he ordered me to leave, to run. And he was on a bicycle, and I was, I must have been running maybe a quarter of a mile. Not even, maybe not even that much. And I noticed that some young lady came to him. And she must have spent maybe 10, 15 minutes with him. And she talked to him. I am more than sure that she saved my life. Because you could keep going. Yeah, and I kept going. And then I was maybe a quarter of a mile, and I didn't know what to do. Should I run away, or should I wait until he comes? But I decided, where well, I'm going to run. I don't know where to run. It was 22 kilometers from the village where I live. I mean, from Bielobrzegi. So I waited until he came to me. But when he came to me, his tone changed altogether. He said, where are you from? And I said, I was born in this and this village. We had a farm there. We were Jewish farmers. In, and I'm used to farming. And that's why I'm here with this and this. Uh, with this and this man. He said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to let you go. I don't know why, but he let me go. And I started kissing his boots, his, his hands, and he said, but you have to put your shantband on. He said, if they catch you, Without somebody that. else is going to kill you. But I didn't listen to him, even though he let me go. Immediately after he left, I took off the, the, the Star of David. And I was pretending that I am Now, Polish. Sam, you were blonde, is that right? So Partially. Partially. Partially, yeah. So after he let me go, and this, the boss of mine, he didn't know about it, that he let me go. And he presumed that, you know, he, he killed me. You. So that day, I was going to go back to, to my parents, to Belopregi. And it was already getting a little bit dark, and I was a little bit hungry, so I approached two Polish ladies, and I asked them, could you please give me something to eat because I'm hungry? So they said, Jews are not allowed here in Polish. Mm -hmm. So right away I saw that, you know. You're in trouble. I am in trouble. So I kept going, and then I saw another lady on a bulk, on a porch. So I went up to her and I said, could you give me something to eat? She said, no, you, you better keep going. If not, I'm going to turn you over to the SS. 
So I didn't have no choice, and I decided I'm going to hide on there in a stack of corn, and I'm going to wait until the morning, and then I'm going to go home. So I was hiding until the next morning. I must have got up maybe 4 o'clock, and I was going to go home, but I was so hungry, and I saw a lady milking cows. When she milked the cows, I approached her again. I said, could I ask for a little bit of milk? And she said to me, wait. And she went into the house, and I was afraid that she goes into the house. God knows who, who, what's going to happen. But her husband came out, and he said, come on in the house. He called me into the house, and he says, give him some bread and milk. And they gave me bread and milk. And he said, you know what I would like for you to do? I would like for you to stay with us a couple weeks and help us with the harvest. And I said, no, no, I couldn't stay because my parents, if they find out, you know, what happened, they, they'll think that, you know, yeah. that, I, that I got killed. So he said, when I go, when I go to Bialobzegi on Wednesday, this was Sunday, I'm going to tell him that you are alive and you are, you are with us. But that particular Wednesday, I did stay with him, with them. And that particular Wednesday, there was no, he, even though I wrote a little note, just two words, and, and uh, I am alive, that's all I, that's all I did. But that particular day, he wasn't able to give my parents the, the, note. the note, and he didn't see him. So when he came back and he told me, I said, no, I have to leave because my parents think that I, yeah. that I'm dead. And even the, my boss knew that, you know. so, and I stayed till Friday. And Friday, I went back home. This was in 1942. A few, a few weeks later, there was a, in Polish we call it a oblava. They gathered Jews and they cut. I was walking in the street and they cut me in the street and they put me on a, on a, transport. not on a train, on a truck. Truck to take me to a concentration camp. That was, that was That it. was the, the uh, August 10, 1942. My mother found out that I am already on the truck. I had my parents, everybody was still alive. So she kept running with a piece of bread and she kept yelling, my kind, my kind, don't. My child, my child. My child. So the truck ended up taking you? Only God knows if I'll ever see again. And as it happened, I never saw my mother again. Where did the truck take the you? The truck took us to a concentration camp in Radom. This was in August of 1942. Radom was a large city. Radom was a large city. It was 3,500 Jews worked in that concentration camp. We were making ammunition for the Germans so they could kill Jews. I was in Radom till 1944, but during that period of time, this was in August, and between September and October, I don't remember exactly, it was on a Sunday, Sunday afternoon, a relative of mine, a distant relative of mine came running to me and with tears in his eyes and I knew something terrible must have happened and he approached me. He gave you news of your family? N not only my family, he said, Shmulek will never see our parents again. The whole town was liquidated you know, 10,000 men, women, and children together with my family. We're taken. We were sent to Treblinka. So when I found out, and I said to myself, it's not use for me to live. 
I lost everything. Just my parents, my brothers, my sisters. <laughs> Treblinka was one of the death camps where many Polish Jews, by the hundreds of thousands, were taken and lost their lives, were killed. So then what, what made you go on, though? What made you go on I at didn't that have, point? I didn't have... I didn't have desire to live. As a matter of fact, I tried to escape. And I, I was hoping that I get, I'll get caught. Yeah. But somehow, that didn't And happen. I would get killed. But that didn't happen. I did try to escape. But I got, I did get, I got caught. Yeah. And I received 25 whips. But I'm going back to Radom. The first week when we came to the concentration camp in Radom, they asked a bunch of boys who was, the, who was 13 years old that they have a special treat for them. I think eight Jewish boys volunteered. They said they are 13 years of age, and they, they hanged them all, all the eight boys. This was the first week when I came to the concentration camp. And the very next day or so, they called me into the uh, office. Mm -hmm. And I was accused that I, I stole a piece of bread. So three or four of us from that little town, from Yalabzegi, we were called into the office. And we were all given, they received 15 whips. But it, when it came to me, I got 25 whips because I told them I didn't steal any bread. Why are you giving me 15 whips? I didn't do nothing wrong. So a Jewish couple, he said, because you're asking why are you giving 15, he gave me 25 as a present. But this was my very first experience, almost the very first week when I came. And then maybe a week later, I, I received another 25 whips because I didn't make enough what I was supposed to make, and I didn't know how to do it. So I was called into the office again. What were you doing? What? I was making bicycles for the Germans, and we had to make 140 bicycles every day. And nobody told me how to do it or what to do. They would just put me to a machine, and I, and I, and I had to do it. So finally, I, little by little, I caught up with them. There's a little story behind this, too, because I had some boots I brought from home. And the foreman, Polish foreman, he noticed that I have boots. He said, I'll tell you what, if you give me the boots, I'll make sure that I write down for you that you are making 140 parts for the bicycles, which I gave him the boots, and he brought me a pair of torn down, torn up shoes, and I gave him the boots. So he would put down 140 was made every day. Whether you did or not. No, I didn't do you it. You didn't do yeah, it, sure. There was millions and millions of parts who would could last for who knows for how many years. Mm -hmm. But I was glad to give him the boots. So, sure. I, so I was in Radom until 1944. And the time when I tried to escape, and I mentioned it before, and you know, I was cut. And I got another 25 whips, so my body is carrying 75 whips. And we were in Radom until 1944, and as the Russian army kept approaching already, they were well into Poland, and they approached Radom. I think they were about 25 or 30 miles from Radom. The whole uh, camp was liquidated. And we went, we were sent to Auschwitz. To Auschwitz. From Radom, we were sent to Auschwitz. On the way, we stopped in a little town called Tomaszów, and we spent just a few days there because it came uh, night time, and we had to stay there overnight. And from then, they put us on a train. In 1944, we went to Auschwitz. And we came to Auschwitz. It was in the morning, I remember. Were you in a group with just young men, yeah. primarily? When we left Radom, there was 3,500 boys 
and uh, women and some children, perhaps just a few children. So when we came to Auschwitz, it was a, a orchestra was greeted us. The famous with a big orchestra. Sign, Arbeit macht frei. And it didn't take long, maybe a half an hour later or so, we were given, each one of us were given a half a loaf of bread. And we said to ourselves, this cannot be Auschwitz. Problem was, the Germans were giving us bread in the morning, and they sent us to the crematoriums in the afternoon. So in Auschwitz, I was just one day, they made a selection like, we called it a selection. So I remember that assessment by the name of Meller, tall blonde assessment, he was just looking at us. Sometimes he would point out to the left, sometimes he would point out to the right. We didn't know which one was good, was it left or right. And we all kept our cheeks red, pinching our cheeks. So, so you'd look healthy. To look healthy. Fortunately enough, we were fortunate. We were sent to, from Auschwitz, they took maybe, I don't remember how many, but after this election, the, the women were taken away with the, with a few children. From then on, I didn't see a woman since 1944. So the women and children, very few survived. They were all taken to the guest chambers in Auschwitz. And we were sent to a camp in Feingen, close to the French border. And the fighting end was terrible. There was no camp. We had to build our own camp. So for three days, we didn't have nothing to eat, which didn't matter because the food, what they gave us, practically nothing anyway. So after three days, we had a little kitchen. We were given a little bit of soup, whatever it was available. We were working on an underground factory. We were building a factory on the day, underground. For the Germans. For the Germans, of course. And I don't remember exactly how many, I, it couldn't have been more than t two or three months, and I wasn't buying in. Conditions were terrible. And they asked for 800 volunteers to go to another camp. I said I had my brother-in-law with me, too, I forgot to mention. And I had my brother-in-law with Your me. Your sister's I, husband. My sister's husband. My sister got married in 1940, and she had already a child, one year old. She went with him to the guest chambers of Treblinka. I said to my brother-in-law, I said, we don't have nothing to lose. The conditions are so terrible. We're not going to survive anyway. Let's try this other camp, which was Hessenthal. This was a small camp. There was only 800 Jews. And we worked for the Luftwaffe, for the German Air Force, right. which from the beginning it was, wasn't bad because they weren't used to this. The Luftwaffe, they, maybe they didn't... Uh, they weren't part of it. They weren't really. part of it or something, and they treated us halfway decent. But when the SS took over, the whole picture changed already. We were under the same conditions like in any other concentration camp. So, but in the Hessenthal, I experienced terrible things. So one day, I didn't have no shoes. My fingers were frozen. My, up till this day, I have frozen fingers. My feet were frozen. My ears are frozen. So one day, I said to myself, I didn't have no shoes, and I was walking around practically bare for it anyway. So I stepped out around 5, 6 o'clock in the morning when we had the appeal before we went to work. So we had an appeal like, a, a roll call. A roll call, right. right. Yeah, if everybody was, uh, well, nobody was missing. And I stepped right in front of the Hauptschaufier. His, his ra rank was Hauptschaufier. One of the top. One of the one of the top Nazis. in this particular camp, which wasn't a high, a high ranking uh, officer. Right. And he noticed me, and I worked out barefooted in the snow. And he noticed me, and he said, was master down here? What are you doing? The husk on shoes. You don't have shoes. I don't have no shoes. And I told him in German, I don't have no shoes because, and I told him what kind of shoes I had. You know, I showed him the shoes. He said, to bleibs here. He said, you stay here. You're not going to work. 
you know, in the order the, the commandant from the, from the camp, he said, don't let him go to work. And it, I was fortunate enough, I took a chance, but I figured uh, what's going to happen is going to happen. So from then on, I didn't go to work in this particular camp. And it wasn't so bad because I used to, I used to shine his shoes. I used to sew a button. I know a little bit how to, how to sew a button. I used to press his, uh, so I So did. he took a liking to you, apparently? Yeah, he did take a liking to me. Not only this, even the Jewish couple took a liking to me. And I made fire for them and I did everything so, so to speak, in the camp, and I didn't go to work anymore. And everybody was jealous of me because I took a chance and it worked. But I got sick in that camp. An epidemic broke out in that camp, the typhus. Typhus. And I got sick with the typhus. And I, was, I got sick so bad that nobody expected me to live. And one night, I must have had terrible fever. And I asked them, the doctors there, they, I was in the hospital, it was a little hospital there too. And I asked one of the doctors, I said, I said in Polish, you have a water. So that means please give me a little bit water. And this, this Polish doctor, a Jewish, he said, why should I give you water? You cannot live anyway. It's not used to give you any water. And I kept begging, please, please give me a little bit water. I was burning up with fever. And the, the same relative, distant relative of mine, he was sick too. And he was laying, he was uh, on the... Lower bunk. bunk. Yeah, I was on the lower bunk, he so was he was the on the bunk. upper bunk. And he heard my... Pleading. My pleading. And he threw himself down, he was sick himself. He threw himself down, Abe Flecker. He lives now in, uh, in Kansas City. He still remembers. He's, when we get, whenever we get together, he keeps reminding me, remember, I brought you some water. And he threw himself down from that bunk, and he brought me a little bit of water. I'm more than sure it wouldn't be for him. I don't know what would happen. But this was a small camp. It was only 800 inmates. But still, the conditions were very bad. The conditions were Horrible. impossible. I'll get to it a little bit later. And they called a the German doctor from the Luftwaffe, from the Air Force. When this doctor came to me, and he, he looked at me, and he said, they curl a hot fleck fever. That means that I, am, I have a typhus, you know, mm -hmm. and I am very bad that it's going to affect my brain, which it did. At the time, I was, I, I got crazy. I didn't know what I was doing. I was completely crazy. But in this particular camp, even 800 people for since, I think, since uh, October till March, we didn't have a shower. We didn't have no, no sanitary conditions. And one day, they decided they're going to ha have a, a disinfection. So all the clothes, what we had, we put in that particular room. And the lice must have been knee deep, millions and millions of lice. And going back to the lice, every time I washed my, my shirt, I had just one shirt, and we washed in cold water. The minute I washed the shirt, millions of lice just appeared already on my body. So one day we had a disinfection. All the time what we were in this concentration camp in Hessenthal, we had one, one day we had a disinfection. And then it approached already March of 1944. And the, and the Allies kept approaching deeper, deeper into Germany. And this was on the French border. And we were, the whole camp was ordered to be evacuated. And I was sick with the typhus. This was, uh, I think, in March of 1944. Mm -hmm. Out of the 800, I think 206 survived. 600 died in that particular camp. We even though it was a small camp, but the, the living conditions were unbearable. 206 survived. So we were taken on a train because most of us were sick with the typhus. We were put on a train, 
from this particular camp, Hessenthal, and I was put on a bunk above, and one who was sick, like me, he was below me. So, and they put me on the, on the bunk above, I asked him, would you please trade with me? You see how sick I am, I cannot, I cannot go down, it would be so hard for me to go down. Please, you go up, and I'm going to, he said, and I said, I'm going to give you a piece of bread. I couldn't eat the bread anyway, so I had a piece of bread. I said, I'll give you the piece of bread if you let me go down. As it happened to be, as soon as we, we were put on train, on a train, as soon as we left the camp, the whole train got bombed. Bombed by out the Allied bombers. By the bomber. Allied bombers, but we were happy to see it. If we were to be killed, we might as well get killed from an Ameri for American bombs, not from the German gun. As it happened to be, this boy who changed with me... Got killed. He, he got killed. Your time wasn't up. It's amazing how people so from, from, So they, all, they ordered us to leave the train, and me, not, not only me, but perhaps a a hundred others were sick and we couldn't walk, so they put us on, on a horse and wagon. So after a few days, when we get to feel a little bit better, so they took us out from the, took us off the, the wagons and we had to march, what we called the death march. That began the death march. So me being so sick, I marched for a little while. I couldn't couldn't continue. I just lay down and I said, well, this is the end. And my brother-in-law, he said, I, I cannot help you. I'm sick myself. I cannot take care of you. So as I was laying down, along came this ape flecky. And when he saw me... He helped you. He said, I'm not going to let you die here. You have to keep going. So he grabbed me and he kept... I. I hung on to it, and uh, he was dragging me perhaps maybe for, I don't know, a mile or so, and then he collapsed. He couldn't go on any, any farther. But in the meantime, I regained a little bit strength. I said, no, now I'm going to, you hang on to me, and I'm going to try to help you. And one, try, we help tried to help other. each other. And from Hessenthal, they took us to Dachau. When we came to Dachau, this was, this was the end of it. In Dachau, we didn't do nothing. We didn't work. We were just laying in the, in the barracks and waiting till death co come. Every time when we went to, to the kitchen, we had to crawl perhaps thousands and thousands of bodies which were already scheduled to, to, to the crematoriums. The smell was unbearable. So, but they ordered us, we had to go to the kitchen, regardless if we want to go, we didn't want to go. Everybody had to leave the barracks. But when we came already to the kitchen, you, how, could, how can anybody eat or drink the whatever the little, bit, little soup that they gave us after you went through all those dead bodies, uh, uh, those, all those skeletons? And then even if they give you the little bit of soup, so someone hits you with a with a whip, or with a whip, and you had to spill the little bit of soup what you had. But some somehow I don't know. I survived Dachau too. And then uh, either in seventh uh, or eighth of April, we were evacuated from Dachau too. So we left Dachau, and there was no place where to go anymore. They put us on a train, and we kept going from one place to another, because the Allies were already in the, deep into Germany. And the, there was no, no escape. So maybe for two or three weeks, maybe for two weeks, at one time we were ordered to march again, because the train didn't go any further. And we marched for a while. Again, so many people died from that, from that march. And then they put us again on a train. 
this this must have been already in April 15th or 16th, something like this. I don't remember exactly. And it came April 30th, 1945. We were sitting on the on the on on the tracks. We were sitting there already for two or three days because we couldn't go any further. And one day in April, a uh, couple days before then, they, we were given Red Cross packages. So we thought to ourselves, something is going on because we are given all of a sudden. Where were the German soldiers at that time? The German soldiers were still, still there. with you. Yeah, sure. The SS were uh, still with you. Sure, the SS were still with us. And in 19, in April 1945, around maybe eight or nine o'clock in the morning, all of a sudden the Germans, the SS, opened the, opened the cars and they said to us, you can go out from the cars. So we, we were afraid to go out because we, we thought they were going to kill us, mm -hmm. they were going to shoot us. And it didn't take long, maybe 15 or 20 minutes later, we, start hear, we heard a rumble like. It was like thundering. And we said to ourselves, what's going on here? It's April, we don't see no, no, and it's, all of a sudden it's thundering. So one guy said, it's not thundering. I think those are tanks. Mm, tanks are coming. Tanks are coming. And we noticed that the Germans, they tried to, to cut off the, the emblems, the SS. So he said, some, well, so we knew that something is going on. And then we, the first tank, there must have been maybe 10 or 12 tanks, there was a, a road right next to the, to the tracks. We saw a train coming, I mean the tanks coming, there must have been maybe 10 or 12 soldiers, and they were walking behind it. one tank, okay. and one tank made a sharp turn towards us. We were afraid, we thought, that we didn't know that this was an American tank. And from behind the tank, an American soldier comes out, and he said in a broken German, to hab kein Angst. Don't be afraid. Du bist frei. You are free. And that's, that's how you were free. I'll never forget those words. He said, don't be afraid, you are free. You don't have to be afraid anymore. This was April 30th, 1945. We were liberated in a little town called Staltach. We remained on the train for a few days, and then they took us to a, a Holungslage to recuperate. Yeah. yeah, and we were in this this camp for a few days, and perhaps a two week, a couple weeks, until we got well. Got well, but still, hundreds died because uh, it was too late. Was too late. Yeah, they were so in, in shape that they couldn't couldn't survive. And then from this camp, I was taken to a camp in, uh, in Germany by the name of Landsberg, the same camp where Hitler spent his, when he was jailed in Landsberg am mm -hmm. This was a DP camp. It was in 1945. In 1946, I met my wife. We were married in, in Germany. Sam, you, today um, you're a successful businessman and you have three grown children and you have grandchildren. Right. Um, is there something that you can tell us what, what all of this has, has meaning for American people today? Well, it's not only the American people, it's the whole world, world. should know what happened to us. And I have a message, not just to the American people, but to the whole world. God forbid, God forbid, don't let this happen again. Because only the ones who went through knows what happened. The ones what, which didn't go through, they couldn't, they cannot. Begin to understand. They cannot understand it. And I don't expect them to understand, but nobody Nobody can understand our feelings, our Is there something we can do? History. Is there something people can do to prevent such a thing from happening? 
the only thing what they can do if something if something begins to happen do something to do something immediately right. not to let it go too far whatever it might be if it's extremist or, or whatever it might be any any sign of anti-semitism or any prejudice any prejudice anything but it's against humanity we should do something immediately we shouldn't wait until it's too late perhaps it would happen in 1933 maybe six million jews wouldn't perish the people who do something in 1933 34 not wait until until it was too late don't let it happen stop right from the beginning did you have an inner strength that helped you to survive no. all of the terrible things? No. Like I said, I didn't, I didn't care for my survival. I didn't care to live. Why should I be better than my, my parents, my sisters, my brothers? But what did I do? What did, what did I do to survive? I do nothing better than what they did. My sister was seven years old. What did she know about Judaism? What did she know about being Jewish? Why didn't she survive? You kept one small picture of her with you, the one sister, right? I kept a picture with my sister. If you ask me how I managed to keep this, this picture, this is a miracle by itself. All what we went through, we were stripped naked. Every time that we went through a Searching. And searching in the, uh, sometimes I black out and I cannot remember the word. I know. And every time I went through, we had to, we had to keep our hands up. And this picture was precious, was so precious to me, but that I hid the pictures under my arm. And every time I went through, I, I kept that picture and until this day. I have this, this is the only picture I have. Of your whole family. Well, I know this was uh, very difficult for you, but um, hopefully in even the short, short story that you've made out of all of the terrible period that you went through, hopefully people will understand that um, not to have the prejudice I and I beg them to understand. I plead with them to understand. Please don't let this happen again. Well, thank you, Sam. Thank you for doing your story with us I today. I did my part for many, many years. I couldn't talk about it. And even now it's so hard to talk about it. But we should tell our stories. Even in a short, a short period of time, I could tell, perhaps I could sit here, perhaps for hours, and tell incidents what happened. But we'll do our best to tell in a short period of time the world to know what happened in the 1930s and the 1940s, not to forget. Thank you very much, Sam. Thank you.